glad you can make it look good. Well, good morning, everyone. We are so glad you're here today with us. I was looking up at the, in the uh, balcony there, and Mike Taylor's with us. Uh, I'm saying that because he's been sick for a while, and, and uh, uh, I look at him up there. I, I, you, you must not feel any better, Mike. You still look pretty sick. So uh, that's from my heart, man. I, I'm, I'm concerned with you. He is from Nebraska, so that's probably about the best they can do. So, uh, so, all right. I want you to stand up today, and we can't greet each other, but why don't you, I want you to stand up. And you, have you, how many has ever been uncomfortable in a, in a public setting? I'm uncomfortable every Sunday. So what I want you to do, instead of shake somebody's hand, stand up. That, that's English. Stand up. And then I want you to point to somebody and smile at them. And that way, the rest of the service, they're sitting there going, what's wrong? All right, so just point to somebody and smile at them. Just, just smile, you know. <laughs> you, know just, you know what I mean. All right, just, just point out and smile at them. So, you, you, you know. All right. All right. Well, I am so glad you're here today, and isn't it good to know that even though we can't control the weather, we can't control a lot of things, our God is always in control. Amen. And what I'd like for you to do is, is just take a minute, clear your minds, clear your heart, and realize that he is the audience this morning, and he is going to be listening to our hearts and listening to our minds, and we can give him anything we have. So let's pray to the God that's still in control. Almighty God, as we are gathered at this time, it, it's, it's amazing to me that we can smile and that we can laugh in the midst of chaos. That we know that though we might be going through a time in the valley right now, that it's temporary. And one of the reasons the mountain view is so beautiful and spectacular is because we've spent time in the valley. And Father, there are people here today that uh, are experiencing loss. Some are here looking for answers. Some are here so broken and they're, they're going to be crying out with their whole heart to you today. And Father, others that are here, many of us need to make some decisions to, to, to do a gut check and look inside our hearts and to see uh, how we are before you. And Father, may we realize that we come before an almighty God who is a holy God, a just God, but a God of love. And may the words of song be a celebration of our relationship with you. And may we pay full attention to every word and everything that is said and spoken today so that when we leave here, we know you've got us. I pray all this in the name of Jesus. And all of God's children said... Thank you. 
song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all people. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary.
Please be seated. All right, everybody, we are dismissing for Kids Quest and Extended Session. Kids Quest and Extended Session. I do have a couple announcements. CIY, the $65 deposit for CIY, July 12th through the 16th, is due today. So if you have not given me your deposit today, I do have quite a bit of people that did. But if you've not yet given me your deposit, make sure you do today. Um, sometime today, just uh, come find me and make sure you give me your deposit. Uh, blue letter envelopes are for CIY. So uh, the way this works, all those blue envelopes up by the office, uh, you just take one off, put whatever money is in the envelope, and make sure you put it in the offering plate, and all that will go to uh, CIY to lower some of that cost. The upper room, there is no youth group or because of no school Wednesday, February 24th. There's no junior high youth group that night. Trivia night. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on over spring break, so I do apologize, parents. One of them is trivia night. It is March 13th. I uh, believe we're going from 6 to 8. Um, it's $20 a person. And in there, we're also going to auction uh, all the kids off who are going to CIY. Uh, for, you get four hours with them. Uh, it's going to be a silent auction, uh, so make sure uh, for if you guys who are going to CIY who have already given me a deposit, you write up your resume. If you need help, uh, let me know. Uh, I can do that. I can help you out with that. Uh, but yeah, that trivia night, it's going to be $20 a person, uh, team six to eight. If you do not have a team, there's also a place to sign up as an individual, and we'll put you on a team. Uh, the sign-up sheet is right on that table right in front of the office. Make sure you sign up. Um, but there's going to be a lot of biblical trivia on that. So make sure you grab Daryl Boston and Sharon because uh, there's going to be a lot of biblical trivia as well as everything else. <clears throat> I said what I said. <laughs> Lock in. That next Sunday, March 14th, uh, the day after trivia night, we are going to have high school youth group here, and we're going to stay in for a lock-in until Monday morning. Uh, one of the games we have planned, uh, we're going to do a Nerf uh, fight I'm going to supply the bullets, so make sure you guys bring a gun, a uh, Nerf gun. Uh, make sure you guys bring a Nerf gun. <laughs> like, and uh, or it's going to be a blast. Uh, that way we've got plenty of time to clean up uh, afterwards and everything. Uh, so it's, it's going to be a blast. Um, I believe the next one, is, is, do we have camp teams next? Oh, yeah, laser tag. Still going on in spring break. Junior high laser tag. Over spring break, uh, we're not going to have a junior high youth group. Instead, we're just going to meet at the church and do laser tag again. So it's going to be the same time as youth group. It's going to run the same length, 6 to 8. There's not going to be any food there, though. So March 17th, the Wednesday of spring break, we're going to do laser tag. There's not going to be dinner provided, uh, but it's going to be 6 to 8, just like normal youth group. Carney trip, junior high, March 18th. We are going to watch a hockey game and dinner. Um, all you have to do is bring money for food. The hockey game's taken care of. Um, but in order to go, I need uh, a sheet of paper filled out from your parents. Um, there's a limited amount of tickets, so make sure uh, you come find me. We'll get that sheet filled out, and that's how you reserve a ticket. The same way with high school. Uh, we're going to spend all day at the Big Apple Center um, on the 20th, that Saturday of spring break, and then go to a hockey game. They start at 7. Um, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I don't know how, what time we're going to get back. I believe the Hendricksons went to a hockey game last night that started at 7, and they didn't get back to like 1 a.m. Um, but it went to overtime, so it was, it was an extra. So uh, I don't know what time we'll be getting back, but it is going to be a late night. Finally, camp. Um, camp trips uh, are in July for junior high and high school. 
Uh, high school is July 5th through the 10th. Junior high is July 11th through the 16th. Uh, also, that same time period as junior high camp is the same time period as CIY. So keep that in mind. If you're an eighth grader and you want to go to CIY, you're not going to be able to, well, never mind, you qualify for high school camp. Never mind. So if you're an eighth grader, now <laughs> you qualify for uh, um, high school camp. And if you're a sixth grader now, you qualify for junior high camp. So come find me. Uh, the registration is open. I've worked it with Jason and Brian uh, to register you guys a little bit later. Uh, we got that all reserved. So if you want to go to camp, let me know, and we'll get you all registered there. Good job, man. Good job. That's a lot, yeah. But you did good. So um, I, I tell you what, I, I like playing music, and I'm, I'm thankful for the uh, group that's let me play with them. I, uh, I inherited two bass guitars from a friend of mine. Uh, when he died, I inherited these things, and they're homemade. And he had a recording studio in his house, and what he wanted to do was have a bass that sounded like a doghouse stand-up bass for bluegrass, but he needed to plug it in. So he made one out of a table leaf, and it looks like it's made out of a table leaf. All right, uh, and the um, the frets are actually welding rods that he sanded down and put in there. And I told Vicky, I said over Thanksgiving, I said I want to buy a bass, and if I play it at church, I can take it off on taxes, you know. <laughs> and she said, you already got two. I'm like, but that's like telling a man you already got a half inch wrench. Why do you need another one, you know? And so, right, you men understand, okay? Uh, so, in any way, I went and bought another bass. And now do I play, and I thank them for doing that. And they said, all I got to do is pay them 25 bucks a time, and they let me play with them. So it's, it's pretty cheap. <laughs> I'm, I'm running out of time, sweetheart. I got to go on. <laughs> all right. Speaking about biblical relationships, uh, today we are talking about the family. And one of the things that I think is very interesting Throughout the Bible, there's three entities that we see that God has established and God set the rules for and that God's going to judge. You go all the way back to Genesis and you see that God set the precepts and the requirements for a family. And he says, a man will leave his father and a mother and a woman will leave her father and a mother and the two will become one. If you have any questions about what God designed as a marriage, then you have what we call the Pentateuch, which is the law books. Five books of God giving us what he says is a biblical marriage. Kind of keep that in your head. Then you see that the next thing that he established when you go through this is he established the government. God ordained the government. God set the precepts and requirements, and even in the Bible, he talks about even say they're not a Jewish or a Christian nation, all nations will be held according to what God has already designed and his precepts. Next month, you'll get into the book of Deuteronomy, and I really want you to pay close attention to Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28 is about 14 verses of blessings of any nation that will follow God. It's about 40 verses of curses of any nation that wants to reject God. You want to reject God as a nation? You go right ahead, but here's what's going to happen. You have no protection. And your money will run out. Your food will not be there. Everything that you need and everything, you, your safety of life, all of it's gone. Your enemies will come at you from all sides and you will run and not get away from them. T Forty verses. You don't want God to lead your home? That's fine. But get ready. You don't want God to lead your government and you want to be able to dictate what right and wrong is and you want to be able to dictate what a marriage is and, and you don't want to use God's precepts for marriage? All right, go ahead. But get ready to face the consequences of that. And you see, the third thing that God established was his people. In the Old Testament, it was the Israelite people. In the New Testament, it's the church. God established the church. And our job is to go back to see how God wants us to run it. And when you're looking in the, in the Bible, this is God's word on everything. God's word on the family, God's word on the government, and God's word on the church. We don't get to decide and we don't get to put any input in it. It's God's design. This past week you were reading through the book of Leviticus. In the book of Leviticus, what you find is one stanza said over and over again, I am the Lord your God, so therefore consecrate yourself before me, because I am holy, you better be holy before me. 
I've had people say, well, thank God we're under grace today. Isn't that wonderful we're under grace today? And what they're actually doing is misinforming people on the difference between grace and mercy. What they're trying to project is mercy. We don't hold anybody accountable for their actions. What Jesus did through grace was elevate what he wanted. Jesus said, this is what the law said. The law says this is wrong. But I tell you, I've raised the standard. So when we talk about grace, grace isn't turning a blind eye to sin. Grace is dealing with sin and helping people to get out of the pit so they can live before a holy God. It depends on which translation you use, but the word holy is either 80 times or 150 times in these 27 chapters. I believe it's a big deal to God. Leviticus is just an extension of the book of Exodus. It's about 50 days, that's what it was written in, and what it actually is doing and the requirements is, here is how you, an unholy person, stand before a holy God. And he's dealing with people who for 400 years, a a people group, have been living underneath what the neighbors were doing, what the Egyptians were doing. And so a lot of the requirements as he's giving them in the book of Leviticus, they were doing, and he's like, okay, you can't do this anymore. This has got to stop. This has got to change. He was giving them the components of holiness. Holiness has two components. When you look through Leviticus, he is giving them exactly the terminology, this is sin. He even says it, this is sin, this is wrong, it's an abomination, it detests me, it's gross before me, it's an uh, alienation. You do these things, you will no longer be my people. And he's even telling them, if strangers are going to live in your land, they will live according to these statutes or kick them out. They don't come in with their gods. They're not going to come in with their ways and their rituals. They will come in and do what I have set before them or get rid of them. He has a high standard, but Jesus elevated that standard. But Jesus then paid the price so that we could live above reproach and above sin. The book of Leviticus talks and and shows us clarity of a holy God, the nature of God. And so therefore, holiness is a separation from sin, that we separate ourselves from sin. But at the same time, not only do you separate yourself from sin, but you're devoting yourself before the glory of God to a holy God. You're getting rid of one thing, but then you're adding something else. There's five different offerings in the book of Leviticus. Three of them are volunteer. The first three offerings are a volunteer offering that you give to God. A burnt offering is a volunteer offering signifying a complete devotion before God. The next one that they give is another volunteer offering, and it's a meal offering. It's dedicating myself that I am giving myself wholeheartedly, and I'm giving myself through thanksgiving. I'm thankful I can do this. The peace offering is an offering that is volunteer, and it's signifying a communion and a fellowship between me and God. The next two are mandated. The sin offering is an offering that you give for the sins you didn't know you committed. You committed in ignorance. What kind of a God would do that? That's mean. That's vengeful. No. That's a holy God, and he's giving his people a way to enter his presence. And he said, I need you to do this for the sins you don't even know you commit because I am a holy God, and I don't want anything around me, and I will not be where sin is. So if you want to enter my presence, you will enter my presence with even the sins you didn't know you committed, you'll be sacrificed for. And the last one, the trespass offering, these are the ones where you know you did it. You know you're guilty. It's an offering of forgiveness. It's an offering of repentance that I want to set myself right before a holy God again. I want to stop before we go on, and I want to give you an opportunity. We today, right now, are standing in the midst of a holy God. We are in the midst of a God that is so holy, but a God that's full of love, that he desired a relationship with you. You couldn't get there to him, so he came to you. And he lived here, died on a cross, 
paid for your sins, no matter what you've done. And that's the greatest thing. You can sit there and you can, you can list, all, look how horrible I am. It doesn't matter. And when you're willing to give your life back to him, it's all gone. We serve a holy God. He's not going to lower his standard. But he's going to give you the ability to raise yours. One man put it this way, it's getting awful hard to raise a G-rated family in an R-rated world. And you look around and, and how even our government is, is just throwing ourselves down, down this rat's nest and giving us away and, and wanting everything to be okay and, and there's no standard and everything goes. And let me tell you what, it can only do that for so long before it falls apart. There's got to be a standard, a, a righteous standard, and you're not going to get it from man's idea. It's got to come from God's word and God's word alone. And the greatest thing is we can live up to what God sets forth because of the Holy Spirit. We don't need to be making excuses for poor living. Let's just face it. It's, it's lazy thinking. It's lazy theology. That's all it is. And when you look at the world we live in, how in the world could America that is saturated with Christianity, saturated with churches in Clay County, Illinois, where I grew up, we had 16 Christian churches in one county. How could a country so saturated with the Word of God be so disgusting about sin today. There's a reckoning coming on the church because we relinquished our responsibilities and our obligations. We were to set the premise. We were to set the standard. And instead of asking the world to rise up their standard, we lowered ours. I don't want a reckoning. I want a revival. And the revival is going to be to where we say we've had enough of half-hearted living and we've had enough of just living by the edge and we've had enough of just getting by in our Christian walk. And we've had enough of it and we're going to step over and we're going to say, if God will lead me, we will do it. And if God's behind it, we can get it done. If the Holy Spirit can flush me and purify me, I'm going to allow him reign in my life. That's when revival happens. And if we don't do it soon, there is a reckoning. And it's going to be on us. The rest of the book of Leviticus is divided like this. You have the first part of, of the focus on the law concerning the various offerings, and that's the next part, and he's talking about this, about the means, how we go before God, and the attitude that we need to have before God. There, there's an attitude he's looking for. And then you look at Leviticus 8 through 10, he's telling us that you've got to come before him pure, the conditions in verses uh, Le uh, Leviticus 11 through 22 is talking about dealing with the heart that you have and dealing with your sin. You go on with Leviticus 23 and 24. These are the blessings. These are the why. Why should I be worried? Why should I enter the presence of God? Because you want to be blessed. Leviticus 24 through 27 talk about the symbols of consecration. And there's two important symbols that are found in this part. And they're found that they're supposed to be constantly being, being worked on. The first one is the lampstand. It's the oil is always to be burning. It was to remind them as the Israelite people that you are the light of the world. And your job is to draw attention to the God you serve. That is your job to light the world around you. The next one was the table of showbread. It was a constant reminder that we are constantly in communion with the God we serve. In a few minutes, we're going to be taking communion. I'm, let me not lie to you. In several minutes, we're going to be taking communion. Brad Cox is going to get up here and do a wonderful meditation. I remember that from a couple weeks ago, Brad. And he's going to lead us into a time to where we need to be concentrating on something. And as we're concentrating on whatever he brings forth to us, we need to remember we're standing before that same holy God that gave these laws to Moses. He doesn't want us to just barely get by in this life. He doesn't want us to be half-hearted. 
He wants us to be his children and to desire to be his children. But if we're going to stand before a holy God, we better stand before him holy. Exodus 20, verse 12 says, Honor your father and mother so that you may live long upon the land that God has given to you. This is several, se- se- said several times. In uh, Leviticus 19, verses 2 and 3, verse 1, he says, I am a holy God. Stand before me holy. And in verse 2, it says, Kids, honor your father and mother. Verse 3, it talks about don't neglect the Sabbath. Don't neglect the time that you think about me. In Ephesians chapter 6, we read this, and it goes after what we read last week about the responsibility of husband and wife. Then it goes to children. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that you may so dwell with you, and uh, so it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life upon this earth. Let me give you the NOV. Honor your father and mother, so they don't kill you. Is that not right? If you were rebellious and if you, if you were messing up and if you were not getting along, the parents would come on, son, we've got to take a walk. And they'd walk you outside the city, set you up, you stay there. They'd rock back and just start throwing rocks at you until you died. There's to be no rebellion in the house of God. There's to be no rebellion in God's people. I've every once in a while I just want to put a few rocks around my house. And the boys start messing up, I just want to kind of say what? <laughs> you know? I don't do that, but I'd like to do that. So uh, I didn't. Let's go on to say this. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. I looked up that word exasperate. What it actually means is to rule by guilt. To, to be the one that makes them feel guilty. And so why are they living the way they're living? Because you make them feel bad, and so they're going to do the right thing because they feel bad. He says, no, you sit out in front of them. Set the positive. You live in such a way in front of them that that's the way they want to live their lives too. When I was growing up, I'd, I'd get in trouble, and either my dad or my mom, whoever come to me first, would go, boy, you've got to be your mom's kid because my son would never do anything like that. Or they'd say, boy, they must be mistaken. Because that couldn't have been you because my boy would never do anything like that. I'm, yeah, I think they're mistaken. I think you're right, Dad. They didn't make me feel guilty. They give me an opportunity to own up to it. My dad, you know, was gone in 2001, and one of the things that still cuts my heart, even though he forgave me, was when I heard the words from my dad, son, you're disappointing me. And that wasn't from guilt. He didn't want me to feel guilty. That was from his heart. And all these years later, to know it was my fault that my dad stepped down from an elder after 30-some years because he had a rebellious child at home. And if I can't rule my home, how can I help rule the church? My fault. He took his leadership in the church seriously. He took his leadership at home seriously, too. But the joy that I can't explain to you when I finally got my life straightened out. And he said, son, you make me proud. But I needed him to tell me and to show me this is wrong. But not out of guilt, out of conviction. And I want to give you just real quickly, here's some 10 surefire ways to ruin your family. Number one, allow jealousy to dictate how you treat each other in the family. And and you allow your kids to be jealous of each other. And, And we've actually said it, you know, um, we were sitting there one day cleaning house and Brant made the stupid mistake of telling us, do you realize that I've never had to clean the bathroom? <laughs> and all of a sudden, he did. And we were cleaning some other things and Jay actually steps up and says, why does Brant get to do this and I don't? And Vicky just saw us, well, we love him more. <laughs> don't allow jealousy to dictate your family. Even in your your brothers and sisters and siblings, celebrate what the other one's doing. Don't don't be jealous about it. The next thing is allow materialism. It is very clear. You can tell me what your priorities are, and I can call baloney on it because your real priorities is what you do, not what you say. Materialism, and and I got to work, I got extra time, or this or that. 
That's materialism. You practice deceit. My wife can look at my phone anytime she wants to. She knows the password on it. She, she, it's all open to her. Uh, if I bring this home, she knows, even my boys know the password to this stuff. There's, sometimes they adjust things on it, and I wish they'd quit doing that because I'm not smart enough to fix it and take it backwards. My son grabbed my phone and put his picture, his face all over it, some weird-looking faces, and then he put it as my backdrop, ugliest thing I've ever seen in my life, and I don't know how to fix it. But my phones are, I'm not, I'm not going to hide anything from my wife. My wallet is sitting up there on the, on the nightstand. And I tell her every time that we get paid, I put a little money in it just in case of emergency. And she's, Why is there money in your wallet? I got paid. Why so much? I got paid a lot. <laughs> but it's there for her. You know what makes a, true, uh, a lie believable? Is that little seed of truth. Every lie has enough truth in it to make you believe it. It's deceit. Treat impurity as no big deal. Sit down and allow your kids to watch movies that you know are, are not fit for them to watch. It is very hard to raise a G-rated family in an R-rated movie, especially when you've got the R-rated movies sitting on your own TV. Make anger a regular part. Actually just get really, really mad and you use anger. Now, you can be mad about things and, be, and be, have a righteous anger, but don't be one of those people that throw things around and you're jumping up and down and, and your wife or your husband is scared of you. That's not right. They say that 3% of married women, 3% are staying in abusive relationships and about 20% lie about the relationships and no one knows. That's sad. Fail to take responsibility for your own actions. That's something you teach at a young age is teach the kids to take responsibility. And one of the saddest things we've ever done in our lives is let everybody win because no one understands the pain of losing. And then they get that way in life and, and we've got to let everything go so no one understands there's got to be a pain. Because of that pain, that's why you try to do better. Take responsibility. Hey, you know what? I'm the one that lost the game. So I'm going to practice harder this week. Or I'm the one that messed this up, so I'm going to try to fix it. Treat marriage and your marriage vows as trivial. Fail to instruct your children wholeheartedly. Kind of serve God in passing. I've set up YouVersion Bible with my boys and with my wife, and uh, one thing that I want to do is do some devotions with my boys. And I said, I want you guys to pick the devotions. And we'll do them together. I want them to get in the habit of, of doing that. And when they're far off and when uh, Brant's at, at, at Hayes University and we're, we're not all together, we still got our U version and we can still do a devotion together. I still want them to keep their nose in the book. Fail to listen to your parents' instructions. Some of you kids know that you're smarter than your parents and I'd advise you to move out now while you still know everything. Some of you that think your mom and dad are stupid and don't know how the world works. I wish I could sit down one more time and write down everything my dad tried to teach me. Because he was preparing me for my adulthood and for what was coming my way. And I didn't think he knew what he was talking about. So what is the outcome of making family a priority in your life? Let me give you some things. Chuck Swindoll said this, whatever else may be said about the home, it is the bottom line of life, the anvil upon which attitudes and convictions are hammered out. It is the place where life's bills come due. The single most influential force in all the earth is the home. And I feel sorry for, for kids who are being raised misguided and, and raised in homes where you, you nonchalantly talk about God or he's not really a priority and, and I feel sorry for them because they're going to get in a world and they're not going to be ready to face that world because they don't have their feet concreted in the word of God. Let me give you what George Barna says in a book called The Revolutionary Parenting. Most of our children are biblically illiterate. Their ignorance of the Bible teaches them to correspond to other facts and only two-thirds of those that go to church, kids, have even a, a grasp of biblical knowledge. 
Fewer of our children are motivated to share their faith with someone else. They went and researched, and only 19% of high schoolers who went to church every Sunday, only 19% shared their faith. Maybe it's because they didn't see mom and dad share their faith. The other reason is they don't know what they believe. 46% state that their religious faith is important to them. Of those that go to church, only 46% of those going to church say, yeah, faith has an important part of my life. Fewer of our children actually take Satan seriously. Only 28% thinks he's somebody that we've got to be worried about. That he's, that he's real. Salvation baffles most of our kids that are even in church. They don't know whether they're saved or not. They don't know what they believe about salvation, so therefore they don't know how to tell somebody else. One-third of Americans' adolescents contend that Jesus Christ might have come back in a physical life. By their own admission, children are confused about theology, and they come up with the conclusion, well, my conclusion is, as long as you believe something, you'll be okay. But did we not just say that we serve a holy God, and if we're going to enter his presence, we too need to be holy. We can't slack off on what marriage is. We can't slack off on what it, the requirements to be holy. And what we have to do is not swim around in grace and call grace what it is not. When the woman was caught in adultery and brought to her, he didn't say, yeah, accept you right where you're at, stay there. I accept you where you are, now go and sin no more. The woman he met at the well, when he met her at the well and he talked to her, and he said, yeah, go get your husband. Well, I don't have a husband. You're right, you had five. And she runs back into town and says, come out here and listen to this man because he knows everything about me. And he expects me to change. And he gives me the tools to change. So what are some things that happen whenever we put our families as priorities? Number one, we get principles, rules to live by, and rules that you will say, if you're going to be in my house, this is the way you're going to conduct yourself. If you're going to be my kids, this is what I expect, some expectations. We expect our kids to get A's on their homework. Unless it's Spanish, we just expect them to show up to that one. <laughs> we expect them to get A's. And my wife looks almost every day at the report card. Here during COVID, a couple of them, I ain't going to say which two, but a couple of them were doing their homework. Both of them. Both of them. There you go. I had to help Evan out a little bit, give him some time. She pulled them to the side. And, and, as, and as she's telling them in her wonderful way they need to get their work done, I pulled out some homework. I said, give me some. I feel guilty too. We expect certain things. We expect them to obey the laws. We expect them to be good citizens. We expect them not to drink. We expect them not to do drugs. We expect certain things out of them. Principles to live by. Our society needs families with standards. We can see what's happening now in our society because we're trying to live with no standards. Their spiritual welfare needs standards. We will be at church on Sunday. Even when we go on vacation, we will find a church to go to. We will be at church. Their spiritual needs are met because we have principles as a family. Protection is found. As a kid, I always thought dad was just mean and give me all these rules just because he was a dad and they'd make up stuff and make up rules. As I become a dad, I realize that's protecting me. Do you realize that the laws that were given to the Israelite people, many of those laws, was to protect them either physically or emotionally or spiritually? Do not allow these people in your, in your area. Why? Because they will bring you down to their level of religion. Don't do that. Don't eat. If you come up on a dead animal and it's been dead for a while, it's got some oozing coming out of it, don't eat it. Why does he have to tell them that? Because, hey, it's a free meal. And they've got to be taught all these things to protect them. When you set your family as a priority, you're protecting them. I want you home at 11 o'clock. Why? Because the idiots and, and, you know, some of the people that are out there, that, some of the people that, that shouldn't be out there, and, and you have a higher risk of getting hit by somebody who's on drugs or alcohol after that time, so you need to be home. Number two is because I want to go to bed, and I'm going to stay awake until you get home. 
And if I have to stay up past 11 o'clock, I, I might just have to be at your curfew to be 10 o'clock. These are reasons we're doing this is to protect the family. I was a little worried today as I was brushing my teeth and I was getting ready for church and something my dad said haunted me and, and all of you have heard this from your parents. I hope that when you have a family that you have one anybody want to finish that? And I'm like oh, I'm in so much trouble. <laughs> and I started repenting right there on the spot. It's for protection. Another reason is because of pride. You should have pride in your last name. Throughout years where I grew up, there was, there was something about a good last name. And, and I had a lot of, you know, I was embarrassed about my family for a long time. And the reason was we were really poor. And, and wearing hand-me-down clothing was just, man, it was just embarrassing especially when you know you got five older sisters. <laughs> Real embarrassing. And I didn't realize how proud I needed to be until my dad's funeral. Sixth grade education, just a common guy, and all these people coming to his funeral. When his own doctor showed up, and the doctor, I don't know what religion he was, but he, he was from a, a, an Eastern religion. And every time my dad went in there, would talk to him about Jesus. And all these people coming in, and several of them were preachers. And they said, you don't know this, but your dad drove a bus to pick me up. Or the old station wagon we had, and they used to call him Uncle Jesse. And some of you kids ask your parents who Uncle Jesse was, and, and you'll know that. And, and dad had one speed. If, if it go to the floor, we take her to the floor. And how these people have families in Christian homes now because some guy would go out of his way to make sure that as a kid they'd get to church. The doctor pulled me to the side and said, I want to tell you something about your dad. He said, every time you come in there, he's trying to witness to me. And said, I look forward to your dad coming, and at the same time, I kind of knew what was coming. He was at our house, and we noticed some things were messing up with his eyesight, and he went to the doctor, and the doctor looked at him and said, um, your cancer's back. And it says, it's almost like your dad had a smile on his face and a little bit of relief. And he looked him in the eye and said, I knew this day was coming, and I'm ready for it. But are you? A doctor. A man with a sixth grade education punched him right in the heart. Made him think about his life. I remember sitting there with my dad at an eye doctor's appointment. He couldn't see. I mean, he literally couldn't see past his nose. He tried to drive me one time to an FFA thing. And he says, I tell you what, son. He said, you're not old enough to drive. So he said, I'll drive, and you tell me when, when the road and the ditches are. <laughs> Let me tell you what. I gave my life to Christ several times on that four miles. As I'm on the bus for the FFA trip, I'm asking myself, how did he get home? Anyway, he got home somehow. Took him to a doctor's visit for his eye appointment, and he's trying to witness to this lady, and he knew churches everywhere. And that's one of his things was to know where a good church was. And he's trying to get this lady to go to church, and she's like, I'm not going to church. It's full of hypocrites. He said, ma'am, that may be true, but I'd rather go to church with one than to hell with one. Man, that was embarrassing at the time. And now I pray I have those kind of guts. I'm proud of the name Hagen. I'm proud of what it stands for, a work ethic, a religion, a Christianity, a strong faith. Jesus, after he was baptized, Matthew 3, 17, he came up out of the water, a dove descended, and a voice was heard, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Man, to get to the end of our life and to have our Heavenly Father say, Welcome home, son. Welcome home, daughter. 
I'm proud of you. Man, that'll be awesome. Every time I drop my boys off, I drop them off at school every morning. I tell them I love them, and I tell them something. What else do I tell them? <laughs> yeah, I tell you that. <laughs> Don't tell your mother. I, I do say that. What else do I say? Remember who's you are. Remember who's you are. You're my son, but you're his son. Make him proud, and you'll make me proud. I want to be proud of my boys, but I want them proud of me. I want my wife to be proud of me. I am proud of her. I want my God to be proud of me. You know, I tried to finish this sermon Thursday, and it's been one of those weeks to where nothing was going right, and I was, I was getting behind on everything. And th Thursday, I headed out to see Barb, and her daughter's taking care of her, pray for her. Corrine's the nurse, so it's, it's, it's kind of horrible for Barb. I told Barb, I said, hey, you're into my category now because she's had neck surgery up and down here. She's like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, now you're a redneck. On the way out there, I remembered that I told Vicki, hey, I'll have supper waiting on you because she's going to have a late night at work. I'll cook supper, and I'll have it out and waiting. And as I'm driving out there, I realized I didn't get anything out for supper. And I'm trying to figure out how do I get home before her that she doesn't know that I failed. Well, I just manned up and got my group together and had men pray for me. I did a stupid. And then I text her, hey, I forgot to get supper out. And she's like, you doofus. Out of love, she says that, you know. I said, what do you want me to do? She said, oh, just go by Jamboree and pick something up. That'll be fine. We'll just, you know, we got, we got the side. Just pick up some meat from Jamboree. And so I went over there, and I'm walking around. And the first thing I'm doing is complaining about the price of everything in my head. And going, man, I'm about to get a loan. Man, this is expensive. Then I saw a dad tell his kids, put it back, we can't afford it. Thanks, God. And, and I think Vicki has a camera on me, and she waited until I got to the back end of the, of the building, and she said, hey, can you pick me up some grapes? Not the green ones, the ones on sale. Sure, dear, I'll walk completely back across this huge entire acres and acres of a store, and I get over to where the produce is, and there's an older lady sitting there. And, and I got confused because the green grapes were on sale, but she said, don't get the green grapes. Get the ones that are on sale. So I'm, I'm picking up the purple grapes. I should have picked up both of them. That way I was covered, but I didn't. And I look at the lady, and I, I'm like, you know, I said, I think my wife has a camera on me, and she waits till I get to the other side of the store. And I said, I know she's in the car laughing at me. And we kind of talked a little bit. And she said, you know, I lost my husband eight years ago to a surprise heart attack. She said, I'd crawl across Kansas to give him some grapes if I could. Thanks, God. Man, that family's going to be out of your house pretty soon. Pretty soon your mom is going to look her in the eye and she's going to be old. That man that you were afraid of all your life is going to be frail. The one that took care of you now, you're probably going to have to take care of them. Those kids that take up so much time are going to leave your home and you're going to have nothing but time on your hands. Make sure you got them ready. That you give them some principles. Make sure that in this horrible world we live in that you give them something that they're going to be protected. And make sure they live in such a way that they make you proud and you make them proud. And when life is all said and done and you lay this old body down all wore out that you made sure they're going to hear the words well done. Well done. Let's work on revival, folks.
we might upset some people. We may make some people mad because we have a standard. But we're still standing before that same holy God. Let's stand before him clean. Let's stand and sing, shall we?
this life and breathe on this heart that is now yours. You can be seated for communion. Well, good morning. I hope you're all enjoying this heat wave that we have going on today. A lot better than last week. You know, our Sunday school class last week uh, talked about, we were dealing with, talking about how to deal with conflict. And in part of conflict means at the end there's probably going to be some forgiveness that's going to need to be granted one way or the other. You know, part of the Christian faith, you know, forgiveness is an important part of that. Christ paid all, paid the price for all of our many sins. He forgives and forgets each one that we confess, and he expects us to do the same with those around us. Forgiving and forgetting their sins against us. We especially need to extend forgiveness to our family members. Often we are less willing to forgive a parent, a spouse, a sibling, or a child than we are to forgive a friend that enters the home. For example, how would you react if a friend comes into your house and spills a cup of coffee on your couch, would you uh, extend the same type of grace to a child or a spouse if they were to spill that coffee on the couch? Maybe that's happened. Suppose you have company and a guest comes and sees this nice vase that you have on your table and picks it up and says, oh, this is such a beautiful vase. Where did you get this? And all of a sudden dropped it and shattered it. You probably uh, respond with, oh, don't worry about that. I can get another one of those. No matter that you maybe got it in Paris, France or something like that. Probably won't be going back soon to get another one. But would you be so tenderhearted to a spouse or a child who did the same? If we want to foster healthy Christian homes, we need to extend forgiveness to those who live with us. No matter how great the offense, we need to forgive. Remem remembering that our offenses against our forgiving God are much greater. So keep short accounts with God and with your family. Next to our immediate family, we have our church family, or our brothers and sisters in Christ. Sometimes they can be hard to forgive too. Well, they should know better. They were born and raised in a church. Well, they should know better. They're Christians. Sometimes those can be hard to forgive also. And I bet if I was to say, has somebody in the church wronged you? Probably somebody can come to mind. Maybe we should think, have I wronged somebody else? Maybe we have, maybe we don't know about it. In the New Testament, they ask, how often should we forgive them? Seven times? And the answer is 70 times seven. So in other words, saying, you're probably going to have to forgive me again. And you know what? We're probably going to have to forgive you again too. Not only must we forgive others, but we must also forget their offenses against us, a much neglected aspect of forgiveness. How many times have you person, people say, oh, I forgive him or her, but I'll never forget. But true forgiving is forgetting. God says that he will forgive our sins and will remember them against us no more. Now, our God doesn't forget things. Our, our God chooses to put those things behind and not to bring them up again. His actions, he models for us on how we should respond with other people hurt us. Forgiveness means that you don't say, you always do that, or there you go again. Forgiveness means that we don't rehash old trespasses against one another like a cow that continues to chew its cud. If we do, we truly haven't forgiven. If we choose not to forgive those who sin against us, neither will our Heavenly Father forgive us. Do you need to forgive someone today? Forgetting that person's trespasses against you? As Matthew 6, 12 says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Maybe there's something that you have done and at this time of communion as we come and we confess those sins that we have committed against God, but there's also some, some sins that we committed against our family members. Maybe immediate, and maybe there are brothers and sisters in Christ. At this time, as we come to 
ask God for our forgiveness, maybe we also need to take some time and forgive others and ask for forgiveness of those that we have sinned against too. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can come here. And Lord, that we can ask for forgiveness of our sins. And Lord, it's good that we come every week because every week we fall short. And every week we do continue to sin. Sometimes, Lord, there's sins that we know. And sometimes there's some that we don't mean to. And that we have hurt you or we've hurt somebody else out of ignorance. Lord, I pray that we can bring these sins and lay them at your feet. Lord, we are thankful that you remember our sins no more. Not because you can't, because you choose not to. Lord, we thank you for that example. And Lord, we pray that we can do the same t to our brothers and sisters also. Lord, as we come here again, as we remember these emblems that are taken, you chose to send your son to die on the cross for us because of our sins. We thank you for that. And Lord, we thank you that he has risen again. And we thank you that we can spend eternity with you in heaven because his sacrifice was a one-time sacrifice to cover all of our sins. Thank you for your generous love that you pour out for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you please take your emblems with me? If you'll open up the first part and take out the bread, which represents God's body that has been broken for us. And as we take the cup and the juice, which represents God's blood that was freely poured out for our sins. Will you join me in praying for the offering? Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Uh, thank you for sheltering us in the cold weather. And Lord, thank you for giving us warmth. And Lord, uh, just, I thank you for the blessing that you pour out on us each and every day. And Lord, you just give us more than we deserve. And Lord, I just pray that you will bless this offering and use it to further your kingdom. And Lord, let us uh, use our our hands and our abilities that you've given us to serve those around us this week. And uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. My wife says I have 80 something or other, whatever it is. But next week when we're taking communion, I want you to think about bacon frying. That's what I thought when everybody's opened up those seals. <laughs> that sounds like bacon frying. So. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I didn't either until then. It must be a God thing. I don't know. Um, no Awanas this week because no school on uh, Wednesday. Uh, meetings this Wednesday night. We have an elders prayer meeting at 645. Uh, and uh, make sure you're there for that. That's awful good, guys. I appreciate that. Uh, next month is March Madness, Missions Possible. And each week we'll be actually getting a lot of the missions. We support over 20 missions. And I'm just so awesome about that. And so we're going to learn about some of the missions we support. And I'm really excited that this church gives out so much to missions. You guys are doing great on that. And the fellowship dinner on the 14th. And talk to Melba Rhodes, or, or Melba Rhodes, talk to Melba Witt and see about uh, what... Uh, meals to bring because we want you to bring food from all over the place and we're going to try different stuff. My favorite Chinese food is uh, uh, crab rangoon. Found out it's not even Chinese food. So don't let me tell you why they call it chow mein. Uh, so anyway, uh, anyway, so make something for that and bring it with you next week or on the 14th. All right. Uh, if, please save the date for this, March 27th from 9 to 4.30 is if Norton, please come ladies, it's, it's a ladies thing, I really encourage you to come to that, uh, it'd be a great way to get you a kickstart on your worship and on your relationship with Jesus Christ, please come for that, and that's it, let's stand up and sing out of here.
great week. Another God.